Hi everyone, it's Sinon once again. On my previous video we discussed the build-up for the first Sino-Japanese war. If you haven't seen the video, please watch it first. Now back to the episode. In 1894, Korea suffered a series of internal rebellions, so the neighbor Chinese Empire sent troops to control the situation. However, and at the same time, the modernized empire of Japan, who had also interest in Korea, sent troops to the peninsula as well. Since Korea had been a tributary state of China for centuries, war between Japan and China was now almost inevitable. After a series of failed treaties between the three nations, Japan started to expel Chinese troops from Korea and sank ships carrying Chinese reinforcements for the war. On the first battle of the war, the naval battle of Pungdo, the cruiser Qin Yuan and a small gunboat who were at the time escorting the troop ship Kaoxing fought against a superior squadron of three Japanese cruisers. Captain Fang, on board the Jin Yuan, retreated the area after sustaining some damage, leaving the troop ship defenseless. The Kaoxing was a chartered British ship and was transporting Chinese soldiers to Korea at the time, but was sunk by the cruiser Naniwa with heavy loss of life, almost leading to a diplomatic incident with UK. Japanese troops conquered Seoul and then Pyongyang, by then, the declaration of war between China and Japan had already been made. These victories forced the Chinese to retreat beyond the Yellow River, leaving Korea in Japanese hands. To oppose this, the Chinese military sent a large quantity of troop ships to Korea to turn the tide of war, this time heavily escorted by the mighty Beiyang fleet. This fleet was comprised of two Dingyuan ironclads that we talked about on our previous episode eight cruisers of different types, an old coastal ironclad, and some torpedo boats. It was led by Admiral Ding Ryuchang, a man who had the difficult task of commanding this diverse fleet. The Japanese divided their forces. A smaller, faster flying squadron with four cruisers operated independently and was commanded by Tsuboi Koso, an aggressive and innovative leader. The main fleet were commanded by Admiral Ito Tsukiyuki, a former samurai who commanded the entire operation. It's important to mention that both Admiral Ding and Ito knew each other, since they both had studied in England many years ago. On the 16th of September 1894, the Chinese troop ships arrived at the mouth of the Yalu River and steamed up the river, dropping anchor 23 kilometers from the mouth of the river. The troops started to disembark operation that lasted until the 17th. Meanwhile, the Beiyang fleet awaited on the Yellow Sea for their return. Then, the ship observers saw smoke on the horizon. The Japanese combined fleet was here. Late in the morning, the two fleets reduced their distance between them and prepared for battle. Ding's plan was to form a line of ships side by side, with the two dinghy ones on the center. However, the difference in speeds, confusion and miscommunications led to the Chinese assuming an edge formation, with the Dingyuans ahead and the other ships behind. Many of the Japanese ships were brand new and their crews still needed some training, so Ito formed a single line with his squadron, which was simpler to transmit and coordinate. Meanwhile, the flying squadron was operating independently, approached from the right side to reign chaos amongst the weaker ships of the Chinese fleet. The Chinese started to open fire more than 5,000 meters, but it was a waste of their precious ammo, since the distance was just too large. The main Japanese fleet followed the flying squadron and made a pronounced turn, managing to position themselves behind the Bayang fleet. Accuracy was far from perfect, but they managed to start massive fires on many ships, and killed many sailors operating the guns. Ding Yuan and Zhen Yuan received most of the shells, but their thick armor protected them. Admiral Ding was injured, along most of his staff, when the command position of his ship was hit around this time. The foremast of his ship was also hit, making transmission of orders much more difficult, launching further chaos on the Beiyang fleet. There's also some confusion on the reports of the battle. Some say that the cruiser Jin Wen fled the battle, but eventually returned and collided with the allied cruiser Xiaoyong, sinking it. The corvette Quan Xia 
also ran away but ran aground and was scuttled. The flying squadron then started to fight the cruiser GUN, commanded by Captain Deng Chi Chang, who, after being heavily hit, was trying to ram one of the pursuing Japanese cruisers. Unfortunately, a large Japanese shell hit one of the torpedo tubes of his cruiser, causing a massive explosion and sinking the ship. The brave Captain Deng was last seen in the water, drowning with his loyal dog behind him. The Chinese cruiser Lei Yuan moved against the Japanese gunboat Akahi, causing extensive damage to it, but receiving in return the fury of the Japanese highly explosive shells, setting the ship ablaze. Meanwhile, the main Japanese fleet made circles around the remaining fleeing Chinese ships, causing further damage to them. This doesn't mean that the Japanese didn't suffer damage. The Yoshino was heavily hit, and both the gunboat Akagi, the Hiei, and the Saikyo Maru were put out of action. The Saikyo Maru, for example, was carrying at the time the IGN Chief of Staff, the Vice Admiral Kabayama Tsukinori and was hit by four 305mm shells from the Chinese ironclads, causing extensive damage. Seizing the chance, the Chinese torpedo boat Filong fired two torpedoes against it. One failed and the other was launched too close, so the torpedo went under the hull. The heaviest damage sustained by the Japanese occurred when a 12-inch shell hit the flagship Matsushima, exploding ammunition in the magazine and killing 100 men as well as causing many more wounded. Admiral Ito survived and was forced to transfer to the Hashidate to continue in command. Near the sunset, Admiral Ito ordered his ships, already low on ammo, to leave the area. Five Qing cruisers had been sunk, most of the other ships were damaged and they had more than 1300 sailors dead or wounded. The Japanese had also sustained heavy damage on most of the ships, but none was sunk. In total, 380 Japanese sailors had been injured or killed during the battle. Following the event, it was time to take conclusions. The three Matsushima cruisers and the whole concept of Johnny Cole were crucial during the battle, but were strongly criticized for its inability to sink the two Chinese ironclads, as well as being too top-heavy and unstable. As a result, they were the last French ships bought by the Empire of Japan. On the Qing side, the corruption, lack of funds for maintenance and proper ammo, as well as indiscipline on the Bayang fleet, was probably the main cause for their defeat. Admiral Ding survived the battle, but his fleet was now much reduced in size and capacity, forcing him to retreat to the harbor of Lushunko. The accuracy of the Chinese ships was superior compared to the Japanese, but this was mostly due to the fact that the Japanese fired way more shells than the Chinese. Their ships were packed with ammunition and this combination with the highly unstable Shimo's explosive almost led to the loss of the Matsushima, but the Japanese admirals preferred to keep it due to its tremendous destructive potential. The Japanese quickly repaired their damaged ships and continued to blockade the Chinese ports, as well as support the Imperial Japanese Army during the crossing of the Yellow River and subsequent invasion of Manchuria. Their quick advance was a surprise to the world, resulting on the conquest of the Liaodong Peninsula and the strategically important harbor of Lushunko, at the cost of many Chinese who were massacred by the advancing Japanese troops. Meanwhile, the remnants of the Beiyang fleet retreated to the Weihaowei harbor. The Japanese couldn't leave those ships free since they were still considered a threat, so they prepared to attack Weihaowei as well, which was done by surprise during the Chinese New Year celebrations, launching panic in the city. Now they were able to bombard the surviving ships of the Beiyang fleet on the harbor and destroy them. On the 4th of February, the Japanese removed the boom protecting the anchorage, allowing access to the IGN torpedo boats. The Dingy One was hit by a torpedo that caused extensive damage and ran aground. Admiral Ding received a kind message from Admiral Ito, asking him to accept political asylum in Japan. Ding was deeply moved by the latter, but due to his honor as commander of the Beiyang fleet, he refused, committing suicide shortly after. 
his second in command, Admiral Liu Buchong, ordered the scuttle of the Dingyuan in the harbor before committing suicide as well. The Zen Yuan was captured by the Japanese and was renamed Qin Yan, serving with the IGN during the Russo-Japanese War. The route to the capital, Beijing, was now completely open, forcing the Chinese to request an armistice. Meanwhile, Japan conquered the Pescador Islands near Taiwan. The Treaty of Shimonoseki gave Korea full independence, but now under Japan's sphere of influence. China was also forced to deliver Japan part of Manchuria and Taiwan as well as pay an extremely high indemnity. Before this could happen, the Taiwanese grabbed the opportunity and declared themselves as independent, forcing Japan to launch a brutal campaign to occupy the island. To pay the indemnity, China had no option but to borrow money from European and American banks at extremely high rates, ruining the economy and further weakening the country. Almost all nations commemorate a certain battle or war that they lost, which eventually became a turning point for them. To remember the sacrifices of the Chinese sailors who died during the battle, modern-day China built two museums with full-size replicas of the Dingyuan and the Xingyuan, with artifacts that were recovered from the two sunken ships. So it seems that Japan won the war. After all, they achieved all of their objectives and much more. But history is always complex, since it was another nation who actually reaped the benefits. It's time for Russia to enter the story. The huge victory that the Japanese had was a huge alarm in St. Petersburg, since now a powerful new adversary had appeared right at their doorstep. Russia needed a warm water harbor near the Pacific, and they, together with France and Germany, forced Japan to return the Liaodong Peninsula back to China in exchange for more money. And then, Russia forced China to rent the harbor of Lushunku, better known in the West as Port Arthur, to the Russians for 25 years. They also received authorization to make the Trans-Siberian Railway through China to connect the harbor of Vladivostok and were now also able to connect by train Port Arthur. As you can imagine, this positively infuriated the Japanese. It was impossible for them to advance into Manchuria since now the Russians were on their way and worst, Port Arthur was now the home base of the new Pacific Russian squadron with a large quantity of powerful battleships that Japan didn't have, right at the doorstep of the land of the rising sun. But the Russians made a big mistake here, because almost all European nations had interest in the area, especially the United Kingdom, who didn't want to see a powerful Russian naval squadron so close to their rich colonies of Singapore and India. To reduce this danger, the UK signed a military alliance with Japan in 1902. For the Japanese, a war with Russia was now inevitable. The two nations would eventually fight as allies during the Boxer Rebellion between 1899 and 1901, but this complicated things since Russia sent even more troops to Manchuria now. To defeat the Russians, the Japanese decided to use almost all the indemnity paid by the Chinese to buy a large quantity of powerful battleships and other weapons that they bought from the UK. And while the ships were being built, the Japanese prepared for war. So I hope you enjoyed these two videos, don't forget to like and subscribe my YouTube page for more videos and ring the bell to be notified each time that I make a new video. For more info about my LEGO models, please visit my Flickr webpage. Thank you and see you next time!